Great. Okay, so welcome to everybody to tonight's webinar on the topic of disability inclusive employment. Uh, once again, as in the, for the last four sessions of uh, fall talks, the webinar will be um, captured and we will have it on both on the website of Football for Leadership Program, Integrated Teams and of Cafe Effort, the, the recording. Um, so we will start with uh, uh, some questions to all the panelists, which I'll present in a couple of minutes. And afterwards, you can ask questions. We will ask you as well to, to participate during some polls and we will explain them how they work in at a later stage. Um, if you have questions, sometimes we might pick them up during the discussion and sometimes at the, at the later stage. Um, yeah, so I think that's all, all from a logistics side. So we've now 32 participants. So maybe start to, to directly go into the topic. So a quick introduction to the organizers of this talk. Um, first of all, there's um, CAFE is the Center for Access to Football in Europe. We are a UFA social responsibility core partner. We were an organization founded in 2009, and we basically work on three main topics or three main goals. First of all, to make football stadiums and organizations more accessible. And this means from accessible ticketing, accessible websites, over everything what is in the stadium infrastructure. Secondly, we wish to support the, and to promote the employment of disabled people within the football industry, for example, through the development of inclusive uh, employment policies together with leagues, national associations or clubs. And thirdly, in the creation of disabled supporters association, who shall then become the voice of disabled supporters and hence um, lead to changes in the football industry. And we work together with, uh, with UEFA and FIFA on, on their major events, such as Champions League, the FIFA World Cup. Um, and we work as well together with Integrated Dreams, who is the main organizer of, of this online talk. Um, they have various projects, and their main project is the Football for All Leadership Program, which is an inclusive and accessible study program with the idea of bringing more people more to disabled people to the football industry, empowering them, giving them more, more access to, to the football industry and helping them to, to gain more skills. Um, football for All and CAFE, we've been working together for a couple of years now, basically since the start of the Football for All leadership. And yeah, we help each other on, first of all, CAFE is supporting the Football for All leadership program in terms of knowledge. So for example, we, we conduct them some of the, the modules um, during the course and we help each other on the promotion of each other's activities. Um, so coming now to the topic, um, short introduction to the topic of disability inclusive employment. Um, in, I mean, we have speakers and we'll come to them very shortly, both in the football industry, but as well outside of the football industry. And from our experience, I mean, CAFE, we're, we're working together with football clubs all across Europe. And unfortunately, um, it's disability inclusive employment is still a rather new topic. It's still a topic where there's kind of like a little bit fear or, or hesitations. And it's I'm not very common that uh, disabled people are employed in the football industry. Just want to share as well some statistics on, on European level. Um, for example, there's a strong uh, disability employment gap. For example, the employment rate of non-disabled people is in Europe um, was in, in 2006, 73.6% versus the one of non-disabled people, 48.1%. So nearly 25% of, of difference in the employment as well, similarly, um, for every job application a non-disabled person makes, a disabled person has to make six before even being considered for a job. As well, from a financial point of view, disabled workers earn 
in the in the UK, for example, one point five one pound fifty less per hour than their non-disabled counterparts. So there's still a lot of change to, to be created, and uh, we hope to, to get some insights on how we can work in the right direction. At the same time, obviously there are as well some, some good practice, and just want to make mention two persons who who we know, I'm not saying that those are the only ones in the football industry, but who are this is a person who are working in the football industry. First of all, Joyce Cook, who was a long time ago the founder of CAFE and who, she is now Chief Social Responsibility and Education Officer at FIFA. Um, so, I mean, um, important as well to bring disabled people to leadership uh, positions in, in football and as well one of our panelists, Paul McNeil, who will uh, present in a second. So we just want to hear now as well a little bit about your experiences about at your organization if you're working in a club. So we're coming to the first poll, which hopefully should up show up in a second. So you should see two questions coming up on your screen. Um, first, do you think more needs to be done to improve employment opportunities for disabled people in sport? Yes or no, please click. And does your organization have a workplace adjustment policy and process? So if you can submit your answers, that'll be great. And at the same time, we'll leave you still a bit of time. We'll start presenting our panelists for today already. So as a first speaker, we have Paul McNeil, who's our representative from, from a football organization today. He's from the Scottish FA, head of uh, community development. And uh, to understand a little bit about his, his story, he discovered uh, in 1987 that he was dyslexic, had uh, struggles uh, at school and returned at a later stage at the age of 24, back to, to education and um, obtaining degrees both from Albert and Glasgow University. And at his current role at the, at the <clears throat> Scottish Football Association, he manages all grassroots projects that are delivered um, with, uh, at all participation levels, developed with clubs, and trying to use football to help to promote social change. Um, he's quite keen um, uh, on champion the topic of, of uh, dyslexia, promoting the positive aspects of, of dyslexia, and uh, regularly delivers talks about these topics. And he's as well an ambassador for Dyslexia Scotland and working on various projects, which he'll talk about later. Um, secondly, we have Daniel Wiles from the organization Leonard Cheshire. Daniel is our training, is training and consultancy manager at Leonard Cheshire. And he's been working for more than 10 years, providing experience uh, to providing advice to, to companies in the area of inclusion of disabled people in, uh, in workplaces. He's been advising organizations on disability practices and worked with all types of organizations, public uh, sector, private sector, and third sector clients at all levels, um, trying to support um, yeah, organizations to become more dis disability inclusive. Uh, in addition, in 2016, he, one of his um, documents he researched and wrote was uh, released at the Disability Forum and was a report called Square Holds for Square Packs, uh, Counter Practice in Employment and Autism. So clearly he is an expert in, in the topic of disability inclusive employment. Thirdly, we have John Akal, uh, who is a uh, the director of op operations from our partner, Integrated Dreams. Uh, she's a master in advanced studies in sport administration and technology, and is a registered lawyer in Portugal, Macau, China, and she's generally focused on litigation, contract, and on labor law. Um, in addition, we have Liz Johnson. Liz Johnson, she's a Paralympian, and she has won gold medals uh, at the IPC World Championship, the European Championships, and the Paralympics in her discipline <clears throat> breaststroke. 
and uh, she has had like a career of nearly 20 years in in Paralympic Games, and she as well has had the honor of uh, reading out the athletes out at the opening ceremony of the London 2012 Olympics Paralympics. Um, in 2016, she announced her retirement uh, from the professional sporting, and uh, then that led her to becoming an ambassador on, on various topics on, on social inclusion and like a particular topic of, of disability inclusion is close to her. And so she founded two years ago the organization Ability People, which is an organization that aims to increase meaningful employment opportunity for disabled people. And she will talk about this organization later. In addition, she was named in 2018 one of BBC's 100 Global Women for work in narrowing the disability employment gap, which I was talking about earlier on. So really an interesting and diverse panel. And uh, so I would say we can directly go ahead with this interesting panel. Can you go to the next slide, please? So we'll start with the question sessions and we'll start a little bit structured. Oh, sorry, if we can maybe quickly just show the results of the, of the panel first. Julie? So not surprisingly, everybody said that 100% um, of all respondents say that more has to be done to improve employment opportunities for disabled people in sport. And I'm rather positively surprised. Um, so it seems that a little bit more than half of the organizations have a workplace adjustment policy and process. I'm pretty sure if we would do the survey to, now we have quite a lot of attendees from uh, the United Kingdom, and I'm pretty sure if we would do this a little bit outside from the United Kingdom, which would uh, unfortunately be even uh, much more negative on that side. But still showing here as well in the UK that uh, there's still a lot to do, that many people have no policies in place. So coming to, as I said, to the session itself. So we'll structure it a little bit um, about different areas of disability inclusion. So we will start talking about employment barriers, then about the commitment to, to disability inclusion, and then activities, how an organization can, can measure their, their success rate as well. Um, so starting with, with Daniel from, from Len Cheshire. Daniel, um, I mean, you've been dealing with organizations for the last 10, 10 years. What are your from your experience, what are the main barriers disabled people face with regards to employment? Well, thank you. It's uh, lovely to join you all this evening. Um, I think a barrier can be anything um, that puts a disabled person at a, a disadvantage. And of course, not all disabled people will face barriers, but we know that adjustments are made for lots and lots of um, different people. Um, so it's really barriers can occur throughout recruitment, um, whether that be in job descriptions, the way that they're written, or application pages, websites can present barriers, the way that perhaps we interview people or run assessments, the onboarding process, people can face different barriers at all of those different stages throughout recruitment. Um, and also in employment, it could be uh, a barrier, it could be anything. Again, it might be the physical environment, of course, the built environment, or perhaps the sensory environment um, can create barriers. or it could be something like the format of a document or the way that we communicate or perhaps hold a meeting or, or join a Zoom call. Um, it could be uh, in the way that we work as well. Um, and we know that we need to be really good at making adjustments or accommodations. Um, I'll try to use one or the other, but it might be interchangeable. Um, but I mean the same thing, um, doing things differently, making changes. Um, and it, the changes could be you know, simple things like seats or assistive technology, or it could be changes to the way that we work um, and our kind of workplace practices. And what we want is organizations to be really good at making those changes. So having perhaps a plan, a strategy in place, giving people knowledge and skills, having that policy and process, and also a good culture um, around workplace adjustments as well. 
Paul, I mean, we've heard like the variety of potential barriers. What's your personal experience um, with employment barriers? Yeah, I, I would probably pick up on some of the ones that Daniel mentioned there, but I would probably go back quite considerably. I have a, a learning disability, um, so it's quite hidden. Um, so I would actually actually go back prior to even getting employment. You've, you've got, we still don't break down the stigma. So still quite a bit of an embarrassment um, to even say that, that you require help or, or you require support. So I think as Daniel says about, about the documents, I found it quite difficult even when, when you phone somebody um, and they say, oh, can I, I'll just write this down for you quickly. Have you got a pen? And you're really embarrassed. They say, I can't actually spell that. So somebody will say their email, my biggest flaw or, or my dyslexia or my, my disability is I can't spell names. I literally just can't do it. Um, and it's not an embarrassment after 46 years, but if you're younger, and, and that's quite embarrassing when somebody says, and you keep going back, and you eventually give up. So you don't actually get through the door. And, and Daniel makes a very good point. People will, will send you things and they'll just say, there's the address. For me, that could be, you might as well send me to the moon because I have no ability um, to get there, going into an office. Um, and, and to give you, the, 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 that, that's even before you get through the door to an interview. People will ask you to sign in. People will ask you to do other things. And, and it gets quite quite embarrassing. But I, I think the bit that, that Daniel mentions, it, it's about the, the, the type of, of information you give over, how it's typed, what's the job description look like? Is it cluttered? Do you need to take a step back and look at it? All of these things makes it so difficult to even just, just get through. But I, I probably go in, in, in terms of that about a policy. Policies are fantastic, but they're only fantastic if they're used. If they're sitting on top of a shelf or on a G drive or on a computer, they are no use. And I think a lot of people use the policies and then drop in. And what I found is when you challenge it, which you have to be brave enough to do, Somebody will say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're meant to do that. But the meant to do that is too late. I'm too embarrassed. I've already done it. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm kind of frightened then and I'm nervous. So I think a lot of people who have, whether it's a physical disability or, or a learning disability or whatever um, challenge you have, you do have to realise that just doing the normal thing can take so much energy that you're just wiped out before you even um, we even get there. So I found it quite challenging at times. I, I, I've championed a lot of times to say, can you change that? I'm quite big enough and brave enough to do that now. But my teenage self wasn't. And I think a lot of teenagers and a lot of people in their early 20s, particularly in the sporting industry, and we've got to remember that people trans, transgress from being a, an athlete or a sports person into trying to get into employment. And that's when they find out yeah, I mean, I have something that's, that's stopping here. So we've got a long way to go. So I think the stigma is still the big bit and the embarrassment is, is still a big bit. And I say that quite openly, honestly. I'm still quite embarrassed sometimes when I make a mistake, but I'm big enough now that I've got over it, but it's still there. It's still there. So there is quite a few challenges that we need to overcome. Yeah, I mean, mentioning the, the stigma, I mean, Lynn, you uh, you've been mentioned as well in... In, in one of the, the articles I read recently about you, that it's not about the ramp to change in an organization, but more about change, changing people's perspective, people's attitude. Can you tell us about your experience with regards to attitudinal barriers? Yeah, for sure. And I think the first thing to say is both Daniel and Paul make really valid points that are systemic in society. And actually it's about how we view these barriers and actually the whole thing about the ramp is these barriers are perceived and it, there's this idea as Paul alluded to that we as people with differences should be apologetic for those <laughs> and, should, and, and, and should try and conform to society's norms when actually it's not about that at all. And again, what, I, what Paul says is completely, like I hear it so many times that he feels embarrassed, but he shouldn't, it's who he is and it's part of who he is and actually, I will have skewed your poll slightly because I put that my organization doesn't have a reasonable adjustments policy because it doesn't, because we're at the other end where we're completely authentically inclusive, therefore we don't need a reasonable adjustment policy. And that's 
that alludes to Paul's point around actually, why is it that he has to put his hand up and, and admit that he doesn't function like everybody else when he's more than capable, but actually if there was just a number of formats where the information was provided, he could choose how he accessed that information. And all of a sudden he doesn't need to explain to people why he's different or how he's different or even feel embarrassed about it. And it's like what we try to do at the Village People is reflect that to, to every person, to whoever our audience is, we make them feel. It's like if you had to go, in, if you had to announce what color your underwear was every time you went into a room, how would that make you feel? Like that's quite a personal um, situation to be in. And actually, so again, it's it's society's barriers, but also it's the, the the, the onus always seems to be on the person with a difference. And that's not just disability, that could be any of the protective characteristics or actually just that you live your life differently and you live further away and it takes you longer to get there in the morning. Like the, these real, every single person on the planet has a barrier, right? And then to, to Daniel's point, it's absolutely, we noticed that significantly with our uh, organizations that we engage with. They, they obviously want to do the right thing. They know, they, they know that they need to change. But so often it is focused on specifically what is happening in the workplace or what is required in the workplace. But one of my team, we quite often do breakfast meetings because it works well and we have organizations that are global. So a breakfast meeting in the UK tends to work for most time zones or a lot of time zones. And one of my team is an amp a double, a bilateral, below, uh, above the knee amputee. But she's not just um, an amputee, she's also paralyzed from her sternum down. So people see the fact she's got no legs and assume that's her only issue. Whereas actually there are other challenges as well. But the point is that she was coming to one of these breakfast sessions and she got to the train station and she said, oh, um, where's the, the ramp operator? And they were like, oh, they don't work until nine o'clock or something like that. And this was like quarter past six in the morning. And we all know where this is going, don't we? But I'm gonna say it anyway. And the, the person went, she said, oh, well, how am I supposed to get on this train? And, and or, or why is there no ramp operator? And they're like, oh, because people like you don't, don't need the train that early. And that again, so when we look, when we're talking about attitudinal barriers, it goes a lot further than within the workplace. And it and actually people, there's there's so much that organizations can do within their within their culture and their environment and their physical attributes, which is why we say it's not about the ramp, though on this occasion it was about the ramp, just in a different place. But actually they don't understand the day-to-day, -day, like Paul alluded to, challenges that just makes everything more difficult to get to that point. And so that takes me back to the idea around if you remove the need to adjust and you just make things authentically inclusive from the off, then people have their own choices to make and, they, and it empowers them and enables them to, to, to exist and perform at their optimum level without unnecessary fatigue. And that might be that um, it's the same when you talk about hours of work. Like I have another member of my team who he does not function because of, because of his disability and because of like his medication and all of those different things. He does not function before midday. Like he doesn't wake up until midday, but then I know that he can work well into the night till midnight. So he can deal with um, clients in America, but it just means that I never, I try and avoid at all costs having him in a situation where he has to be somewhere for 9 a.m. in the morning. If it does, if it's the odd occasion, I ask him and if he's okay with it and he's got the support to get there, then it's fine. If he doesn't, we move it or we do it at a different time. But actually nobody else needs to know why we're doing that. And it doesn't matter to anybody else. So it's this idea that actually we are trying to adjust normal in inverted commas life to fit into a template where actually, if we just look and focus on what needs to be done and why people are like, and what people are doing, not how they're doing it, then actually we become a lot more productive as a unit and a team. And what it does is, like you said, it naturally diversifies the workforce because we so often talk about diversity and inclusion, but actually if you are authentically inclusive, then diversity is a byproduct of that. And like, so the back to my point about not having a reasonable adjustments process, we don't need one because everybody can access what they need to as and when. And that is ultimately where we want to get to in life, where we don't need people advocating for D and I because it just is. Because if you look at your community, you look at your society, it is naturally diverse. 
like that's the way the world works, but it isn't naturally inclusive, unfortunately. Yeah, I totally agree that that should be the, the right direction. What, what do you think, how can we go into this direction? And I mean, you mentioned the workshops and what, what type of, how can you raise awareness that people think into this direction? So at the Ability People, what we do is we focus everything around the three E's, which is expo increasing exposure, education and empathy. Because people can't be blamed for knowing what they've never needed to know. And also you can't, you can't be expected to know how to deal with a situation that you've never found yourself in before. And so what we do, like I said, my team is completely um, authentically inclusive, but also it's, it's very diverse. Like we have people who have acquired their disabilities. We have people who have invisible disability. We have people who are parents, people who are not, people who are BAME, people who have different sexual orientations. We have pretty much everything within our team. And so what that means is when we, when we work with an organization or an individual or a partner, they learn that actually we live the change that we want to see in the world because all it is is increasing people's understanding that people who are different are still human. And, and, like, and like when you say it out loud, it's obvious, but actually you'd be surprised how unobvious it is to a lot of people because people are almost, they're like, oh, there's a pity or what a shame. Or they're, they're trying to change you so, that, so that, you, that you fit into their world, like I said before, or you think like they do, or they, you look like they do, when actually, that's not what, what makes us who we are. Like it's our differences that are our strengths. And I'm sure that Paul has coping strategies that no one else has ever thought of, but actually they would benefit others as well, not just people with dyslexia. And it's this idea that actually what you see in front of you and how that actually plays out are completely different. But what we do with our workshops is We, we tell real life stories because every, when you talk about lived experience, the problem is everybody's got lived experience. It's just from different perspectives. So when, you, when what we do is we tell real life stories like, the, like that example of the train station, or I have another, we have another um, team member that's a wheelchair user and he was eating, he'd gone to the local Pret Manger, which is like a, um, you know, a lunchtime shop and he picked up his lunch and someone came up to him and was like, oh, you shouldn't really be in that. And he was like, pardon? And they were like, well, you know, you're in that chair, so you, you don't exercise so much as everyone else, you, so you'll get fat. And like, what? That's no, like, you don't even know my name. Why are you saying this to me? But people feel that they can. They, I mean, the problem is that they genuinely think they are being, like, it's coming from a good place and they're helping. So what we try to do within these workshops is use these examples and then pick them apart and say, It's not, it's never what you're saying, it's how you're saying it, or it's never what you're doing, it's how you're doing. Like if people realized how uncomfortable Paul felt when he gets information in an email and he can't, like it just looks like someone's thrown a bunch of letters at the, like a screen and they've just stuck, then they would think of doing it differently. And it's just raising people's awareness and making them feel comfortable. So you, one, bust all the myths, but also you remove the fear because so often people are too scared to ask because they don't want to offend you. But most people, well, no, all people who are different, they know they're different. Like it's not a revelation that you're you, like, like we've got one team member with one, with a uh, missing his arm from like, the elbow down. And so he says the amount of people that say to him, Oh, you've only got one hand. He's like, really? I woke up and it was there this morning. And I don't know where it's gone. Like, Simple things like that, that actually, and people go, oh yeah. And once you say it out loud, it's obvious. But I think the key is not just having one person and one voice saying it, having lots of different people who all look different, that ultimately remove these stigmas and make people realize that we are focusing on characteristics that can't be changed, but also don't define us. I went on a bit then, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's great. I mean, I'm... I'm, I'm maybe asking for, to all of you, like, I mean, I, I like the example, for example, somebody preferring to work in the, in the morning or in the evening versus the, the morning. So basically, would you recommend, like, for example, a human resource department to ask employees about what are their work preferences in, instead of what you say, like, picking out the disabled people and asking them for particular access requirements? Could that be a, a process, kind of? Yeah, I, I would I would agree. I think I think 
Liz makes a, a lot of very valid points. I think I, I, my head nearly fell off when I was nodding so much. <laughs> but I think something has changed within the, the lockdown period. COVID has actually made us rethink about how we communicate, how we do things. Are people visual communicators? Are people better at orotating things? Zoom has changed a lot of the way that we think. And, and I like that point, Liz. I am terrible in the morning because my, my brain just doesn't kick in. I've got two young children. Trying to just do all that and then try and read an email is impossible. So you're right, find the strengths of people. I I cause a bit of um, chaos when I, when I hate the terminology. People go, right, let's start brainstorming. And you think, well, I've just to think now because it's 10 past 10 and the meeting's starting. Whereas at three o'clock in the morning, I'll come alive and I'll think and I'll get up and I will actually type it up because it's the way my brain works all of a sudden, all that information I've got has came alive and I'll do it. And I have to admit, the first the first couple of years of working, my boss would say, Gonna stop me sending me emails at three o'clock in the morning. I say, just turn your phone off. It's a simple thing for you. Turn your phone off because I won't stop doing it because it's how I I can operate. So you're right, find the strengths of people, not the negativity. I like I, I like I, I use that a lot, Liz, in terms of the let's have an inclusive system as opposed to let's find that we found this bit of jigsaw underneath the couch and we now need to ram it in somewhere because we've employed them no let's make the systems better because see if we make an inclusive system for everybody i I, I, I really like that education but it's like finding a quiet space in the office everybody could do with that not just somebody is dyslexic or somebody that's got a bit of autism or somebody that's got a bit of ADHD. We just would all like to be able to have a quiet room. But why should I have to go and ask for that because I'm dyslexic and sometimes I just need five minutes of quiet to decipher that email. But imagine we could put that in somewhere and, and do that. And the last bit that I'd written down when you were doing that, which, which I think is always a good one, I once asked my organisation if we could turn our emails off on a Friday. I said, why can't we just turn them off and just give us all a period of time to calm down and relax? You thought I had said, can we chop each other's heads off? Because I was trying to make them understand that sometimes every human being could do without getting hundreds of information poured on them. And I love that fact of having an inclusive workplace as opposed to let's ram it in. So you're right. I think finding people's strengths and then working out how they can support the business as opposed to we've employed you. Now, what do you need? Do you need a colour pen? Do you know what I mean? It's just madness. But it, it is changing. But I think we need to be brave about the, the changes we try and push for. Great, great, great ideas to, to become a more inclusive company. Daniel, can you maybe tell us a little bit of how you support companies in becoming more inclusive? Absolutely. So Learner Cheshire, we exist to help um, disabled people live, learn and work. Um, and we do that in lots of different ways. So in terms of the work there, we work in, we have a couple of different programs um, that work with disabled people and with organisations as well. Um, Change 100 is a, a fabulous program which connects talented disabled students and recent graduates with uh, paid internships at uh, employers in the UK. So that's there for uh, any disabled graduate, perhaps um, coming from any different university or having done any degree at any age. Um, and what we have is an inclusive recruitment process. Um, our teams work with um, the interns and then we work to connect them with employers as well for really valuable um, paid work experiences. Um, that's gonna really accelerate and help their career paths um, so lots of time, lots of the roles are full time, lots of flexible, um, certainly during the last six months, been lots of changes as well um, with people working remotely um, through Change 100. And what we do is we, we offer that support to the interns over six months um, for a mentoring and professional development program um, to give that confidence around sharing information and particularly around adjustments and, and having those things that we, we've all been talking about kind of those things that really work for them and, and learning about those things and putting those things into practice. Um, and also we help the, with the employers around that as well. So giving them support and, and understanding and development and learning as well. Um, the students get a, 
a great um, peer group um, of, of people that are there and it's in similar position to them. So it kind of develops their network. Um, and what we find is it's, it's worked with around 550 young people um, in the last seven or eight years. And we work with 160 employers. So really great experience that, that works for both the uh, intern and, and for uh, the organization as well. In my team, the training consultancy team, we do that piece of work with organizations as well um, to help them think about how can we remove barriers? How can we build inclusive workplaces? How can we take a really good best practice approach um, to disability? So we provide lots of support around giving people knowledge and skills um, and, and not so much in terms of disability but that, that really practical stuff that we're talking about as well how to have conversations um, how to perhaps spot that someone's facing a barrier um, how to do things differently and make changes um, we also support with strategy and kind of your organization what, what you're trying to do where you are um, or it might be with the policies and processes that you have or or thinking about that that sharing information piece how, how do we um, ask questions about disability but actually how does that tie in to to our organization our culture um, and what we're trying to in, achieve in terms of an organization um, and so lots of different ways and uh, that we work with employers and uh, disabled people in the UK and internationally as well. Oh, it's great to to hear that you're both supporting like the employers as well as at, at the employees. Um, Joanna, maybe um, from your point of view, obviously you go more to to the employee side. What was your reasoning and maybe the impact you had after the first? two years of the Football for All Leadership Program. And if you want to state as well, what it's all about for those who haven't heard about it yet. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jochen. Um, so the, the leadership program uh, is, uh, was, was founded by Jose, our founder. Uh, he essentially, uh, during the master, so, so we met through a, a sports management program and uh, uh, I, I think that throughout the program, he started uh, thinking about uh, inclusion on several aspects. And he came to the conclusion, talking to interviewing a number of organizations in, in football in particular, uh, he realized that uh, uh, actually there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of uh, programs or, or uh, there's not a lot of disabled people working in football periods. So, uh, he he essentially started reflecting on it and thought, well, why don't why don't uh, I start designing something, creating something that could help fill that that gap? Because it, with effect, there's there's no representation uh, that reflects in the industry of football uh, the percentage of the population that is uh, that is disabled uh, and, and we all on this panel know that it's uh, roughly uh, 15 to 20 percent of, of the global population so so in that he designed uh, the training program it's just to just to introduce what we do and I came on board uh, shortly before the first year so we've had two editions of the training program uh, this year unfortunately we couldn't do it uh, because of the the pandemic uh, so we were doing these talks instead. Um, and so it's very quickly just to explain, it's, it's, it's separated into two stages. One is an a, a on-site uh, lecture uh, training program uh, that where CAFE also delivers an accessibility, a stadium accessibility appraisal module. Um, and, and amongst other things, we do personal development, leadership, uh, a little bit of coaching, uh, project management skills. So we do, and some, some sports organizations always also come and introduce themselves, uh, for-profit and not-for-profit organizations uh, present themselves. Um, so just as very quickly to, to, to say that we work with people from across, um, from across the, the world. We've had... Uh, 31 participants from 15 different countries uh, joining in the two years that were where we've had the program. Uh, and so we have a little bit of a broad uh, overview of, of people who 
who joined because we've had people from El Salvador to Mali to U the UK to Russia uh, to Armenia. So we have people coming in from different cultures, from different languages, and so we have a little bit of an overview uh, of uh, you know different stages of development on the, in terms of implementation of the social model. Uh, to to the point that Liz was making before. Um, the the barriers uh, the 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 way in which the culture or the geography or the country are in views uh, the disability or whether it's a barrier the, the barriers are within people or we're talking about the built environment it changes a lot from from country to country and from participant to participant so what we've seen and this is the model uh, that we've adopted uh, basically we work with each participant, uh, creating a system that uh, essentially promotes their inclusion through sport, uh, through employment, or through development of their own projects, um, uh, it, which is tailored. So we're we're not we don't have a you know one size fits all kind of solution. We we work with with each participant. Uh, and we, we structure it in a way where the participant has a support system. So they work with a mentor, with a local organization from their own country, uh, whether it's an internship or their own project that they're, they're developing a, an entrepreneurial uh, initiative. Um, and we support and we try to you know, connect all of these moving parts. Um, so uh, I don't know if that answers a little bit of your question. Our impact is a little bit uh, spread all over because the projects of our participants and the path that they choose is very different. So we have people developing podcasts. We have people working. We have one person working in the Portuguese Football Association that went through an internship and now he's basically has a job there. We have uh, uh, George from the UK who's developing a network for uh, employment in sports in the in the UK and is starting with the WhatsApp group essentially and then he hopes to develop that further. Um, we have people working on stadium accessibility projects. I mean, the impact, we usually say that we impact, the, the real impact for from our program is for people that we don't even know because hopefully our participants will you know each of them will plant a seed wherever they live uh, and that will promote uh, inclusion in around sports in one way or another it doesn't have a one-size-fits-all <laughs> approach and, and do you feel like i mean you mentioned the, the, your participants who have like projects and, and at their organizations do you feel like the organizations support them or is it rather okay we we have something to improve our reputation to have somebody participate in this program or do you think it's they are committed to to change in at their organization no to, with with everyone that we work with we really feel that there is a a, a real will you know a real will to 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 include uh, to include the person and uh, not not so much on a you know we're doing good for society on a charity kind of mentality no not at all with the organizations that we work with we really feel that uh, it's a collaboration with everyone so participant uh, oftentimes the participants mentor is from someone from outside of the organization sometimes it's from within but not necessarily and we really feel like it's a partnership and there is a genuine interest in, in making it a, a success, not a tick in the box. Uh, so that's our experience. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Liz, you, you have as well a, a tool how you measure success of organizations. Can you tell us a little bit about how, how you do that? So we're currently working on collaboratively with other organizations to come up with a measure of that impact, but not um, like we all, we all have our own measures of impact, but like a almost like a system, like a medal type system that people can self check. And if they then need, if they, because what happens so often is people do a lot of work in an area, get themselves to a point and then think they've done enough because they're so much better than they were to start with. But actually it's this idea of, of continually moving with the times and continually updating to ensure that you don't become comfortable in a zone. And then so, so yeah, so our TAP index, what we're hoping eventually is that it will be 
not an accreditation because again accreditation is similar to processes like paul mentioned they're good to a point if, if people um but often with accreditations what happens is people do what they need to do to get the accreditation but actually what you want is to embed it so that it becomes everyday life and as daniel said about the part of the culture so that it's synonymous with what you expect in an organization or a workplace and you know what you're getting um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're collaboratively working to get it to a point where we've got a tap index so you can just know which, and we're going to do it again, 50% of, about 50% of my tap team were Paralympians, 50% weren't and never wanted to be and that's cool and again that, that just shows that not every person with a disability wants to be an athlete because they don't. Um, but essentially we, we decided as a team that we would use a, a medal system, so bronze, silver, gold and then platinum. And again, it would be to, but it reflects everything. So because so often what people will do when they're working on inclusion and diversity is that they'll focus on one area of it. And they'll say, oh, we haven't got budget to deal with um, BAME this year. We're, we're dealing with the gender pay gap, or we haven't got budget to deal with disability because we're dealing with BAME or so on and so forth. And actually what we're seeing is, no, if you go for authentic inclusion, you can do it all at the same time. Um, and so, and then, and it's not, sometimes it's about the physical aspects, sometimes it's about the location, sometimes it's about the hours you work, but sometimes it's just about the way people speak to each other and the way that you interact and do you feel safe and comfortable to be yourself. Um, so that, yes, yeah, so it, it would be, it's a medal grading system that encompasses the entire experience of being part of an organization. Um, but again, it's one of those things that we're constantly developing and evolving because you, you, there's always more to learn, there's always more to do. And I guess there's always, there's always going to be a new situation a first time. And that, I guess, again, is to do in this area of work is something that people should always be aware of, but also be comfortable with is you're not supposed to know everything and you're not expected to know everything. And it's not about what you know, but it's about how you react and how you deal with these things. And, and that's why processes, like I said, they can be brilliant, but they're quite limiting because often what happens is like, like both Daniel and Paul alluded to, people live by the process and actually it becomes restrictive because then we've had clients that go, oh yeah, but we can't do that because it says we have to do it like this. You know, yeah, but that's not working. So actually you're filtering out people, whether that be in recruitment or you're suppressing people's potential, whether that be if they're already in the organization. So actually process is, is good, but only if, again, it, it, it caters for everybody. Because I, and, and the great thing about making sure that you are authentic, authentic and inclusive is you benefit everybody because I've never ever been discriminated against because I'm a female, ever. No one's ever looked at me and gone, are you sure you're going to be able to do that because you're a female? Because they're more concerned with the fact that I have a disability. And so then my point with that is, and what makes that powerful is that actually, it means that gender's not an issue. If, it only, if it's only an issue when you've got nothing else to focus on, then it's not an issue, right? And actually, I'm here to show you my disability is not an issue either. But there are changes that need to be made so that people can, can navigate barriers that don't just benefit those with disabilities, they benefit everybody. And actually the amount of times I've been doing things, like I, nothing to do with work, but I would, once was abseiling Cape, uh, Cape Town Table Mountain for charity. And one of, the, one of the participants said to me, oh, well, if you're gonna be able to do it, I've got nothing to worry about. And like, she didn't mean it in a negative way, but what it does is actually, it's powerful. If you have people who, who are, who are inspiring is the world's worst word and it's so overused, but actually what's inspirational about people who are overcoming barriers is not the fact that they, they've got a disability and they managed to get up in the morning and actually exist, but it's the way in which they navigate a world that is not set up for them. That's the inspiring part. And actually by creating that accessible environment and, and making people aware of these differences on, as a whole, that's why we have this idea of where do you sit on the continuum and actually you can go back and forth so you're not safely in gold forever but also it's not it's not an idea of yes you're better than you it's a personal like for each organization it's a it's a, a representation of where you are in this continuing journey 
yeah, if I understand correctly, it's, it's uh, KPI, which is really based on organization, not comparing one organization to, to yeah, other. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's the other thing is certain, areas, certain organizations do certain things brilliantly already. And other things, and like the, the other thing is that people seem to see it as a massive mountain to overcome, whereas actually often it's only a few small tweaks that won't take that much time or that much money. And the benefits are, are massive, but people, again, they have this idea in their head of what it's going to take. Yeah, makes sense. Paul, can you maybe tell us a little bit about your experiences you, you have at the Scottish FA about their activities and maybe not focusing so much on the processes, but on actually yeah, changes you, you've been doing. What we do, what we do to make a change. Yeah, I think some of the, the, the things are, are, are really resonate with with the journey um, that we really try to be on. I've been working in the Scottish FA for, for well over um, 15, 16 years now, and it's been a journey. And it's been a journey to try and change perception it is, is the biggest thing I think we would, we would want to do. If I use this as an example to bring it right up until what we try and do within disabilities or try and be inclusive as, as best we can, if I go back probably best over 16, 17 years to, to use the accreditation, but we had an accreditation from our, our, our clubs and Liz is, is absolutely right. People look at it and go, what's the bare minimum I can do to get here? And then I'll leave it all. And, and you kind of thought, well, that's not really what we want. We want you to make change. But on that as well, the majority of our clubs were still based on football. And if I'm, I've used football as that, is it was a game that was played by white males. And nobody was nobody really kind of bored with anything else. And if you try to, to attack that stigma, you kind of get you get thrown back. So at the very start of it, we wanted to, to say to people, well, if you want to become one of our community clubs, you are going to have to change your club name. It can no longer become Boys Club. And we got a lot of resentment to people saying, over my dead body, will we change that name? And we've luckily, we just stood by our guns and just went, no, we're not moving. We want to change the perception of our sport that is inclusive. And if you have a club, I don't care if it's been about for 50 years, that has a terminology, boys club in it, half the population don't feel they can come. So that was wrong. As we've moved forward, I think what we've tried to do is we try to use the terminology of football for all. But to use that, you have to be inclusive and you have to look at ways in which you make your environment or the culture of what you want to do as good as you can. So a number of years back, um, one of my colleagues, um, David McCardo, set up the, went down the road of trying to get us to be to have a para football ANA, an affiliated association that would look after our para football. But we had to go about celebrating, and I think that the part that Liz makes there about showcasing that it didn't matter if it was a men's Scottish A internationalist or a part, they were, should be spoken about in the same bread because they represent our country and they do the thing. So we have to start to break these barriers down. So we started to do a lot of work around about that, working with our clubs to understand the things. If we look at some of the, the things that we do for, for autism, um, if young children want to go to a game, why should we stop them not being allowed to go to a stadium? And people will say, oh, well, it's often noisy. Well, let's look at ways in which we can have quiet rooms because that's not that child's problem. That's what we've set up. We can do something. We can make the environment in that stadium safe, that the family can get there, they can go in. And as any other family in the world, they can have the experience the same as anybody else. We should not just say, well, that'd be awful difficult. Well, I'm sorry. You have to look at ways in which you provide a level playing field for everybody. So when I look at some of the things that, that I look at and over the, the period of time, our power chair, our, our mental health groups, anything that, and I, it's, it's a difficult one because you say it and then you regret saying the words that makes it people are a little bit different. And, and, and I, I kind of resonate with some of the points you make there, Liz, about, yeah, oh, you can't do that because you're such a, in the party in your head. It's like still people will say, oh, you made a spelling mistake. I think, well, I'm going to make a spelling mistake for the rest of my life. I'm really sorry about it, but just leave me alone. But 
it's like some of our para-athletes are phenomenal, but we have to give them the platform and the same breadth on our website and on our social media campaigns to do everything. So I'm very proud of what we've done round about our game leaders. We really are now trying to do that, but it's going to take it's going to take more bravery. It's going to take more people saying the things. Liz, I like the, the things that I've written down here. You said at one point, you said, I did go on a bit too much, but no, you don't because you, you, we have to, because we have to keep hammering the things home. It's easy. It's so easy to talk about our, no, well, it's not if you're Scottish, to talk about our men's A squad, but it's easier to talk about the male game. It's a wee bit easier now to talk about the female game. It's a little bit easier because it's a wee bit more now accepted. Talk about para football, people kind of go, well, what's that? And I think we have to continually do that. So the things we've done is we've pushed, we've, we try and give everything the same voice, the same energy that we do. Para A game leaders get funding. We try and support them as best we can. We say to our clubs when we meet them, we say, and it's a bit where Liz uses, we have an accreditation system, but we say, are you representative of your community? And they'll say, yeah, yeah, we've got boys and girls. Yeah, but 5% of your community, where you are, have got people who have got a disability. Where are they? Oh, well, I don't know what we do about that. Well, you better start thinking about it because you're not a community then, unless you're going to do something about it. So I think we have to be brave and we are trying to be, and I, and I think we, we put that across to everybody within the association that we're not just talking about a men's game. We're talking about people. And then when I look at it of an employment point of view, it's about making things right for everybody to make people feel comfortable that they come to their work and the environment they come to is as inclusive as we can make it. So we, at the moment in time, it's very challenging because of lockdown, we've got people who've got young families and we just walk round about them. So see if a Zoom call comes up with a member of my staff and they have to have their child in their knee, who cares? They are trying their best at this moment in time. So it's just about accepting that all the differences and all the challenges we've got. And yeah, we might have employees that, that let's say, might have to uh, like to work at two in the morning. But why should we take that strength away from them? Why don't we just... It, it, exploit that and say that's good you like to work at that time we'll make that good for you rather than we'll make that that you need to be there at nine o'clock in the morning when it is impossible it's the one last one that I'll, I'll leave you with it's it's the funniest one i always find with and since i came into a kind of management role i always for the for a number of years i don't ever ever say to him they never apologize if you make it any work at half past nine why the heck did we think starting to work at nine o'clock in the morning and sending our children to school at nine o'clock in the morning was the best idea in the world. Because something has to give. Children either have to make their own way and maybe run people uncomfortable, or parents have to feel really guilty about sending them. So that was crazy, but we still do it. We still do it. And if people come in at five past nine, people go, are you late? Yeah, my child was crying at the school gates because they didn't want to go in. So let's think about how we make the environment for a workplace better. And I think it's about doing these things, shouting about them, but putting them on the right platform. So I'm quite proud of what we've done with our para &A. Um, We're not there yet. We're far from there, but we're, we're kind of getting in the right direction. And I think that's that's all we can do at this moment in time. Great, maybe similar question to the others. What can organizations do to, to make all of their employees feel welcome? Don't know whether anybody wants to particularly. Daniel, do you want to go? I feel like you haven't been able to speak for ages. So, do you want to go first? <laughs> to, to make uh, employees feel welcome, welcome was that? Um, well, it's a big question, isn't it? Um, I think I think there's lots. I think um, if we think about if we think about disabled employees and and kind of workplace culture I think a, a workplace that's understanding of difference and and celebrates difference and, and working in a different way um is is one that's going to make people feel really welcome and supported I think Liz's point around just making adjustments and it just being part of of what works for everyone I think 
I think that understanding piece is important as well around, we've got that 15% figure, um, but I think in reality, it's likely to be much, much higher than that. Lots and lo you, you do and you will work with lots and lots of disabled people. There's kind of challenges around that figure and, and sharing information. And I think lots of, um, there's lots of reasons for that and I often talk to people about those reasons and, and like we said earlier it might be um, having a bad experience it could be that you've never shared that information before it might be a, a new condition it might be um, you're worried about your progression and, and often people bring up lots and lots of these reasons but also it's about actually as an organization what reasons are we giving people to share information with us and and kind of changing that focus and, and that thinking to actually what, what are we doing as an organization, I think is really, really important. And so um, there's a great piece of research on this called Secrets and Big News. Um, and it's a book that looks at um, what makes it easy and harder to share information. Um, it's published by Kate Nash, Kate Nash Associates. Um, they spoke to around 2,500 uh, disabled people. They spoke to 150 employers. So there's really great um, knowledge sharing there. Um, the book's really available as well. We'll ensure that um, the link goes to you. But what, what the book looked at was what makes it easier and harder to share information. And it gave the ideas of employers, it gave the ideas of employees, but then it also gave really big, 15 big challenging ideas for employers to think about what to do in terms of sharing information. And, and actually what that was getting to was it's not uh, just about that question about sharing information, all of that piece is about culture as well and actually as an organization the way that you do things and the actions that you take as an organization how that relates to your strategy how that relates to your culture um, how you give knowledge and understanding of all the positive things we're talking about and actually take action as well so to kind of come back to the question around making people feel welcome I think doing that really well the thinking about culture and how that relates to sharing information and um, promoting inclusion um, is is a great way to ensure that people can feel welcome, but also thrive um, at work as well, which is what we want. And I mean, you, <clears throat> how do you feel like, how important are those? I mean, we've, we've spoken now about the em employer side and like making people welcome. And from Paul mentioned as well in the beginning, like the importance of having the confidence, which, which sometimes might be, be lacking due to the attitudinal barriers. How can you, empower people to to become more yeah make more confident and maybe you can talk about your your can do program as well absolutely um so with the the confidence i think often we see confidence people don't have either knowledge so not understanding around disability or not understanding around what language to use in relation to disability or it could be more of the skills kind of um, how to ask those questions how to talk about disability how to talk about adjustments um, how to practically do these things um, or it, it could be from that confidence and a lack of experience as well and i think probably through training consultancy and also change 100 one of the greatest things is it starts to become normal and actually making changes and doing things differently starts to become normal as well and and like we're all saying there's making action uh, taking action doing things is what we all really want um and so that's really important to support um, organizations start doing those things start putting those things into practice as well um our can do programs a, a program that works with disabled young people so people from the age of 16 to 35 um, and it's driven by their interests and their passions and, and it fits those things into a framework that tries to build their skills and confidence as well so it's almost 3,000 um, people that have taken part in can do um, in 2019-2020 to help build their confidence and their life skills um, as, as part of um, people within communities as well and so during a pandemic, a lot, a lot of that's moved to kind of virtual delivery and, and spend time on these virtual platforms as we are. Um, I was lucky enough to take part in one of um, the initial um, workshops, which was all around identity. So we spent time thinking about um, ourselves and identity and, and trying to build that confidence amongst young people, um, which uh, is another thing that Lena Cheshire do as well.
can I can I cut in here and ask a, a question to well to on Daniel's point, but to all of you? I received the question from from Lewis McConnell, who is a participant from our program in the first year, and he's asking a lot of jobs require university degrees, um, even if they don't necessarily need a university degree to then perform the duties. What would your advice be um, if you know if you don't hold that university degree? And uh, but you're really keen and you feel like you can do the job. So I'm asking on behalf of Lewis. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't mind coming in here. Like, again, this is where my team, like how we change and challenge people's perceptions, because this is, again, one of those unconscious biases that people have that you need a degree or if you haven't got a degree, it's because you like, oh, you're disabled. Like people are surprised, and this is not to do with disability, but people are surprised when my degree is in business management, not sport, because I was an athlete. Like, why wouldn't I have studied sport? But like, so I, and like, again, our team, like some people have degrees, some people don't. And actually one of my, one of our most successful uh, team members and consultants, he doesn't have a degree. And it's not because he's not capable. It's because he's got a, an impairment that where he relies on a certain level of care and he was like, I don't want to go to university and waste, for him, it was waste four years of my life. Like he always says his life expectancy is lower than the average. Therefore, why would I spend another four years studying when I could just get out and live my life? And actually, so to Lewis's point, it's super frustrating, but the onus here is on us all to educate the organizations, to realize that a degree doesn't define people. And there is, there's more than one reason of why a person didn't go to university and it doesn't mean that they're not capable. And actually when people talk to this team, my team member who's in this situation, they're amazed that, that that's the reality of his life. And then when you say it, you're like, of course, if you're only on, if you're only gonna be on a planet for a certain amount of time, why would you, why would you waste time doing something you don't need? And he, like I said, he's just as successful. He's just as capable. And actually, it's this idea, again, it's this idea that of us as a society thinking we know what people should and shouldn't have. And actually, it's the 21st century, right? So to a lot of points that Daniel alluded to is people, we have more knowledge now as, 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 a, as a human race, we have more knowledge. And actually, people with disabilities have choice, just like everybody else. And now they won't. They won't go for jobs if, if they if they access a, a platform that is is inaccessible. They've got an opportunity. They're just going to walk away. No longer are we in a position where we should be grateful to, for being spoken to or being grateful for the opportunity. What we want is an equitable experience to show what we are capable of. And like so often, people focus on equality, but actually treating everybody the same is not is not fair. Because if you treat everybody the same, they don't get the opportunity to show back to Lewis's point of, um, of what you do if you haven't got a degree. Well, somewhere we need to convince organizations that somewhere on that form, there needs to be what other experience have you got or, or what makes you just remove the degree question and say, what makes you, you suitable for this role? Like, because actually people, can, if they've got a relevant degree, they can put it down. But if they haven't, it removes the barrier for those that haven't. And actually nobody then, nobody's disadvantaged by changing that question or removing the degree question. But actually, because actually you can be book smart, but I have no clue what you're doing. <laughs> but actually people who, who haven't been to university for whatever reason might possess all of the skills that make them an absolutely amazing employee. And I think, again, that links us back to prejudices and unconscious bias. And again, this idea of society's um, norm. I mean, quite frankly, it costs a fortune to go to university now, especially in the UK, especially. And so like even me and my sister, who my sister would never have gone to university because she's a lot more practical than I am. And she didn't want to go to university anyway. But she's significantly younger than me. That means that for her to go, it was 10 times more expensive than it was for me to go. And the reality is that's a barrier for some people. So why should they be excluded because, so because of something that they can't control or they didn't want to do? And so that it goes back to this idea of looking at, a pro, looking at a, an issue and seeing how necessary that barrier is in, in terms of a person's capability of performing the role. 
I, I, if, I, if I just add on, because I think you make a, a, a fantastic point, Sarah, is that if I go in and, I, and I say to any young person, so fortunately my, my age gives it away, isn't it? I started primary school in 1979. By, by, the time, by the time I got to be nine years of age, because of my learning disability, um, nobody knew about it. Um, so a teacher screamed in my face one day, um, after being hit, because because that's what happened in the seventies, even eighties, you kind of get hit by your teacher. That I would amount to nothing because I was a problem child, and and I shouldn't really dream very high. I, I should just give up. So I did. So I did, and, it, and at fourteen I gave up. But luckily enough, and I think this is a good thing in terms of what we're talking about in terms of sport. I had sport that kind of dragged me along and gave me a, a bit of ability to learn. So after leaving school, uh, probably in the, in the 80s, I, I went back into full-time education. And Liz, the reason that, that, I, that I, I did that was that was seen as to achieve. If I could get my degree, somebody would say to me, you've achieved. But moving my way through that, I learned that all the learning I had had from my work experience, being in shipyards, playing sport, doing all that, helped me more than when I was going through. The education became easy because I had something that had wrapped around me, the colleges and universities wrapped around me, they gave me the right support. But my knowledge didn't come anywhere from books. It came from the years. So I always say there's not right or wrong path. There is a journey you have to go on to get to where you want, you want to go. So I, yeah, I did achieve my university degrees. I got out but I always remember somebody coming up to me at university and I kept telling people I was dyslexic and saying, Paul, any chance you can do me a favour? I says, yeah, no problem. Could you proofread this for me? And I says, I don't think you really understand what, oh, yeah, yeah, but, but you're dyslexic. And I said, yeah, but I, I can't spell. And they went, all oh, right, how do you pass everything then? I said, well, a lot of hard work. But what I also learned and the, the advice I would give to any young person is my employment didn't come from my degree. My employment came from working with the YMCA, coaching a lot, spending a lot of hours. So I tell every young person I, work, I go and speak to when we do anything in here, our outreach college courses or anything, find something that works for you. You might not go on and do a university degree, but you might build up a lot of things. And as Liz quite rightly says, we live in the digital era. We don't live in big conglomerates of, of things. You can go and do something yourself and it might make you really, really happy rather than doing what I did sitting at three o'clock in the morning, going through all my references for my, 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 my undergraduate and then my postgraduate degrees. So I think some things we have to change the way we think. Do we lose a lot of talent in this country because we think you have to go to university? Absolutely. I do yeah, on your point, Paul. Sorry, have you finished? I don't know if you'd finished. I thought you'd finished. Carry on. No, I was going to build. You lose a lot of talent. Yes. Yeah, build on your point. It doesn't matter if you're if you if you have a disability or not. School is a very structured system <laughs> that, whether, depending on which home nation you're in in the UK, you either start four or five, you know, somewhere around there, and you go to your 16 or 18. But some people don't know what they want to do at those ages, and they're not or they're not ready to learn at that age. And so, why do we judge people on that? That's not fair either. And so, again, this is one of those situations where if we change the parameters to enable those who require it those others can benefit as well because like Paul says he had his diagnosis yeah he got it later but he had it eventually yeah. there's plenty of people with disabilities out there and conditions that aren't diagnosed but and they or they fly slightly under the radar but it doesn't mean that they have any it's any easier for them to navigate a world mm -hmm. and so we put like the other the other issue we face is okay if you if you've got a name for the way that you behave then okay we can give you this but if you have this support and this is available to you but if you haven't well tough you've got to like mix it with the big guns and, and make it in the in, in the world with everybody else and and that's not fair either so actually as Paul says we lose so much talent even if, and then you get some people who manage by hook or by crook or by luck to slip through the net but actually that's chance. And yeah. so why, why would you not want to make your workforce the strongest that it could possibly be? And I think to add on to the top of that, Liz, as well, is we're talking about football here predominantly, but sport, we still don't use sport 
as the one of the most powerful vehicles we have in our life to educate. Sport still within the environment is seen as an add-on. It's seen as a luxury. It's seen probably as some of the creativity things. Or you know, some, if, if you behave, you might get your sport. That, that is an insult to the way we educate. Sport should be seen as, as an additionality. I, I, I do a lot of talks from my, my other role as, a, as an ambassador for Dyslexia Scotland. I speak to a lot of parents and I speak to them about their young, their young people coming through, their, their children coming through. And, and I have a rule in my house with my two young children. Uh, we don't have any double jeopardy. So if you get any trouble at school, we don't take away your sport in the evening. You go to your club. Because that might be the only time they succeed in that day because they've had a really hard time at school. So, so there's been a lot of times when I think we don't use sport enough in this country. It learns you so many things, Liz. You, you'll know it be, better than I will, but it learns you about a discipline. It learns you about being on time. It learns you about working hard. It learns you about a communication skills. It, but it doesn't seem to be taking that. And a lot of people who drift into sport are a lot of people who either have learning disabilities, physical disabilities, because it's something they excel at, but we don't celebrate it enough. And, and, I, and, I, and I take the one thing that, from my own young son, I had to move him to school because the whole education system broke down. He just couldn't work in. We, we found a school, but his sporting bit was the bit that saved him. It was the bit that he put my smile on his face at the end of the day when he'd spent five years. So for any young person that's out there listening, and as I say to so many of them, follow something that you dream about and it makes your heart bounce because if you do that, you will go up there. If you go and you do a university one, sometimes you'll just go, this is really a drain and you'll just drift off. And then you will find it. It might be when you're 20, 30, 40, 50, you might go back to university, but you might have succeeded in something that's really, really good. So I think there's, there's something that we need to promote sport better about as, as a way of learning as opposed to just an extra thing that, that you see at the weekend. It's not, it's so much bigger than that. Yeah, and I think just to finish off on this, because I feel like we've gone on a lot, but again, but again, it's not just sport. It's, it's, I always say to young people, similar to you, Paul, I speak to a lot of young people, and I say, I was fortunate, I was academic. But if they had judged how intelligent you were on how good you were at art or how good you were at music or dance, then I would have been bottom of the class. And I wouldn't have, like, like and, and again, but actually the world needs creative people. I don't have a creative bone in my body. And actually, so I rely on other people in my team to come up with ideas and make things look pretty because that is not my game at all. But you're right, Paul. And actually this hopefully ties back into Lewis's point somehow is that it's about everybody's got a skill and a talent. And it's not fair that we live in a world where having certain parameters and certain judgments suppress that. And so even if you find a way on that form to, to show them what you're good at, to show them the skills that you have, because yes, a degree, okay, it, so for some people, some people learn loads in their degree. Some people don't actually learn that a lot at all and they couldn't remember anything they've learned. But the point is, that's what people are looking for. But actually what they're really looking for is that the fact that they think if you've completed a degree, it means that you have skill set A, B, C, D and E. But in reality, if you've got a goal or a passion and you're motivated, the chances are that that has caused you to develop every single one of those skills that they're looking for. So look at ways to show that and look at, and bring that to life so that they can't put your application form down. And actually, this is why we need to move away from the idea of computer says no. And I think there's been some questions in the Q&A around like, what can we do? when, we're, when we're, we're, we're putting jobs forward. And it's, and it's just, it is, it's the language you use. And so when people, like, what is it that you're trying to ascertain here? What do you want your perfect candidate to have? The perfect candidate probably doesn't exist, which is why we all work in teams. But what is it that you're looking for in that candidate? And how can you give them the opportunity to show you that they've got it? What in, what in the job description or what in the, in the necessary spec is restricting your talent pool. Yeah, and I think what, what we suggest as well to organizations is not focus on, for example, how you do a task, but much more on what is the result 
and what do we want to achieve? So if you show much more that and, and not talk about the degree, the qualification, but really are you capable of bringing as a result? I think that's much more important. So, and this has to be reflected obviously in a, in a job description. So. Okay, and now we are like already way over time. So I'm trying to um, bring this before we come to the Q&A quickly to some last questions, maybe. Um, I mean, we've heard a lot of things or a lot of comments. Do you have any other suggestions for organization who start working to be, wish to become more inclusive and generally in particular disability inclusive? What tips and tricks do you, can you give to organizations? Maybe start with, with Daniel as we haven't heard him for a while. Sure, thank you. Um, Tips and tricks. Um, I think involved disabled people is always important. Um, now that could be through um, a survey or focus group or feedback group. Lots of organizations have um, uh, uh, disabled employee networks or it could be um, your customers or, or people that you work with as well. I involve them in um, finding ideas and solutions and, and talk to them um, and look at what's working and what's not working. I mean. I think we, we keep going back to this point of, of taking action and strategies help with that and having plans in place and, and kind of having senior people involved. Um, that's all really helpful. But what we want to happen is that actions taken. Um, so um, look at your recruitment processes, um, look at the ways that you make adjustments, um, involve disabled people in the conversation. Um, those would be three, um, three top tips. Joanna, maybe you can talk as well about your your thoughts on, on mentorship programs, your experience at, across the program, or if you have any other ideas. Yeah, I just want to reinforce what, uh, what Daniel was saying in terms of involving disabled people, definitely. I mean, they're everywhere, so uh, why not involve them in the, in the process uh, uh, from the beginning, in every stage uh, as you go along. Um, uh, I would say... Uh, also focus on what uh, it's it's a little bit of repetition of what you guys were saying in terms of what needs to be done to 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 do the job but focus on ability and what what actually people can do and, and not so much what you know on the disability uh, so it's a little bit of the same thing but it's in, in terms of you know changing the perspective on uh, not so much the, the disability side and more on uh, okay, there's a job description here of something that a task that needs to be done, and what can the person bring to uh, to the table in terms of actually producing the outcome that is intended. Um, so, uh, I also wanted to uh, address. I don't want. I'm not. I'm. I, I'm answering your question, Jochen. I just. I, don't, I also wanted to address what uh, Joanna Deagle is asking in the in the chat about uh, legislation. Uh, if uh, some countries require um, a certain percentage of, of disabled people to be employed, um, and uh, Portugal is one of them, but we, as I said, I work we work with a lot of the different countries. I I have to say that uh, not only regarding disabled people, but you know, gender-wise and wherever wherever there's a quote, I think it's in my opinion and at the association we we feel that it's useful also to to uh, as a tool uh, uh, to to as a means to an end not uh, not, a, not as an end to to itself um, in terms of you know involving uh, the the population in in, in the process um, of course it would be better if it wasn't necessary uh, obviously um, but uh, yeah those would be those would be the points that I, I would reinforce involve disabled people basically uh, to what Daniel was saying uh, hear them out, collect data, ask, look for data, where, where are these people, what are they doing, what are they interested in, etc. Um, in some countries it's easier to find than others, um, I have to say. And we're, we're also talking about, uh, you know, accessibility and Zoom and platforms. Make sure that your, your platforms are accessible. Um, because everyone is online, that's true, but not, not every website and not every platform is uh, accessible to everyone. 
So those are things that I think everyone can do in terms of starting to, you know, be a little bit more um, open, uh, adjust, uh, create, uh, eliminate those barriers. Uh, as Liz was saying also, um, maybe not put a person in the position of where they have to ask for some special treatment or in comma, in quotes, quotations, uh, not special treatment, but you know, the, make the person uncomfortable. That's what I would say. Paul, Liz, any further comments on that? I was, I guess I was just going to say, uh, I, Daniel, Joan, I agree with everything they've said. And I guess that, I, and it actually relates back to the question in the chat is about um, involve disabled people, but involve the right person with a disability for the right problem. Because so often, as, as is mentioned, either, either people get attributed to certain roles or get given a responsibility based because they are, oh, they're the person. Well, like, why would you ask someone who uses a wheelchair um, a question about a visually impaired um, issue? Like find the right person to ask and involve it, them at every level. And actually there is need for representation throughout the organization. And you do, you need people that can champion it and actually are passionate about it and deliver it. But you need people who can actually sign, sign off the action and the change and enable it to happen. So it's a collaborative um, approach with everything. And I guess the other thing I was going to say is we like Joanna, there is a need, sometimes there's a need for quotas and you, you have to do it to, to, to move the marker and to get the needle moving. But at the ability people, we always say you should only have those quotas for a certain amount of time because, other, because otherwise all you do is compound the issue because you fill the quota with people who fit the mold, but they might not be the best person for that job. And then all that does is compound the stereotype that people with disabilities aren't as effective as they could be. And it, because the reality is, just like any other demographic, people with disabilities, there are people who are inspired and motivated and resilient. And there are people that have no intention of wanting to like pull their weight or do anything. And it's actually getting to a point where you can make that judgment call. So ask yourself again, like with everything, why am I why am I thinking or about to do this and how is it relevant and if it's not relevant then you don't need to be asking the question or performing the action that would be one of my top tips and then finally I think again back to one of the questions is Manuel makes a really good point like what are the main areas you think better for disability people to work in football and like it's a great question and like it shows that the desire to make this work is there but actually what are the main areas that you think are better for people to work in in football? Like, would you like, and this isn't a criticism, Manuel, so please don't take it as one, but it, it, it brings to life the thought process of people. Like, why is it that we're trying to, why are we trying to find them a role that suits them? Like they're more than capable of applying for a job that they, they want to do or willing to do and have the skills to do. So make it so that they can, like, how can we enable the masses to reach their potential? They would be my three, things I think <laughs> <laughs> sounds great Paul any any further comments or I, I think it's just I think it's listening and taking actions from listening I think you can do all those things and sometimes you just don't sometimes the actions don't get done because you don't listen to 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 what actually gets fed back and, and I give you I give you a practical example uh, in our organization for many a year the, the, the first pair, the new person to start would be dragged around every other employee as the introduction. One, it would make everybody feel uncomfortable because you forgot people's names and departments and, and that day one. And the other person who was the new start hated it because they, they didn't know MD and they were getting dragged around. So I once said, I don't like doing that because processing for me doesn't work. I can't remember their names. I can't remember the departments. I feel embarrassed about doing it. Half the people aren't there. So HR said, well, take that under review and, and it's a good idea. I just stopped doing it as a department. I just said, look, let's stop this because it's it's not working. I feel embarrassed. I forget half the people's names. You feel embarrassed as a new start. So the first person that came in, I said, do you mind if I just introduce you to the people in my department first? Because I know all them and I know their jobs and it will let you bed in for a, a week. No problem at all. And I'll tell you what we'll do. We will then go and we will try and get people and speak to them about their job, not just attacking them in a Monday morning. 
And 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 eventually my HR came back and said, You don't do the walk round anymore. I said, I won't do it. I just refuse. And eventually they went, that's actually not a bad idea. And everybody just started to do it. So I think sometimes you have to listen to whatever employees say and ask them. So it didn't come from HR, the decision. It came just because everybody went, Hi, we actually prefer doing it that way. Can we just stick to it? So sometimes we don't listen to our employees or we don't listen to people. And then you quite right, we review it and then we come back and somebody goes, we did that two years ago and we said the same thing. So sometimes it's just doing the action that is the right action to do. And, and I go back because I'm going to steal Lizzie's one. Make the society inclusive for everybody because you will make a better environment. And you, you can have that one for free, Paul. <laughs> doing my big pad. Probably spelt it wrong, but... You will make the, if you make the environment better and more positive for everybody, you will get a better workforce. Whereas sometimes we're just still ramming it into, into the wrong holes and, and, and it's the wrong way to do it. But, but make it inclusive for everybody, not just because somebody's got a disability and you need to then remove the ramp, for example, because you don't need it. That's the wrong way to look at things. Uh, I think you've, you've summed it up pretty well. I, I think the the main takeaways from from my side is as well once again to to listen to all of your employees to create awareness like for example with those lived experiences with Liz was mentioning at the beginning and Daniel as well talking in the the area of yeah becoming a fully inclusive uh, employer and, and make all your your employees feel feel uh, supported find the skills of each employee and not saying this is you have to do it this way, but find the way which works with which each employee. Yeah, find finally the strengths of everybody. I think those were the from, from my side the most major key takeaways. I'm just checking. No, no further um, question. If I could add on that, on the so on the employer side, but on the employee side or on the applicant side, based on the feedback that uh, we got from, from you guys a little while ago uh, and to, to answer Lewis's question. And, and we have this question a lot because our, our program is not certified training. So it's not like you have a degree uh, when you finish it. And the, the, way, the reason why we did it um, was because we have people who have finished high school and then we have people who have PhDs. So and they're in very different levels of uh, form, in terms of formal education. Uh, so uh, to, to the employees or to the applicants, uh, focus on what you can do uh, in terms of that would, I, would, I would be summing up in terms of what you guys, the advice that you guys gave. Focus on what you can do uh, and on what the job requires and, fo and make sure that the conversation is around your abilities and your, you know, your experience to do, actually do that job. That's, that's what I got from, from your, your answer before. Yeah, and maybe once again for, for the employee year side. So, I mean, as it's maybe to, we've seen in the beginning, like to many organizations, it's a relatively new topic. So if you want to start in it, consult with organizations like Len Cheshire, the ability people, or as well us, and get support from people who are experts already on, on, on the training side. I mean, I'm sure you will find an organization in, in your relevant country who, who's willing to support you and then yeah, consult with your with disabled people to, to get better understanding of how you can change the attitudes within your organization and not only one single process. So any any last words from, from the group or Great. Can, I, can I just add something? I'm sorry, y'all can I keep it. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, uh, I read an interesting study from 2017 from the BCG, from Boston, the Boston Consultancy Group, and they made a study on innovation tied to the diversity in teams uh, and the way teams are built. And granted, they didn't study disability, but they studied a lot of other factors, almost every other factor. And they came up with a very, if you can find, it's on, available online. It's very interesting. The percentage of innovation that comes out of um, a team that has diversity, more diversity in it compared to the other one where there's less diversity is astonishing. So if you guys can find the, the study online, check it out. Uh, the more diverse the group, the better the solutions, then the better the income, the revenue for, for the company. So just to leave it out there. Maybe to, to build on that, we are 
um, I mean, the, the panelists, they shared as well some, some uh, links with us that so we will share with them afterwards with, with all the participants. So, and if you have some questions, afterwards, please feel reach out to all of them as well. So coming to an end now, uh, first of all, thanks. Thanks so much for this, like, yeah, really, really interesting discussion. Uh, yeah, it seems as well from the question coming up that the great interest and uh, we from CAFE, we have already um, said that we want to do another seminar in January. So we'll keep you posted about this one as well, because I think it's, it's a yeah relatively new, but in a very important topic. So thanks to all the speakers. Thank to the audience for all the questions and uh, finally letting me have a look then to the next week where football for all talks continues with a, with another session and uh, next week on the monday 16th of november it's at 6 p.m central european time or 5 p.m uk time about the topic of how are other sports promoting inclusion and we have once again some interesting speakers victoria austin from the Global Disability Innovation Hub, Miroslav Krugelic from Special Olympics, Geraldine McTavish from the Gaelic Athletic Association. So next week, Monday, same time as today. So once again, thanks to, to all of you and we'll follow up with some, some links and, and so on afterwards. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, goodbye.